Yep. And so, um, how many of you are familiar with Neo4j? Raise your hands, please. OK, good. All right, that'll let us know. Um, how many people are just starting out, don't know anything at all about graphs, are here to learn? Excellent. OK, very good. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to um, run through some very basic stuff pretty quickly. Um, you might have seen some of this in other talks. Um, and then uh, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about um, why graphs are catching on, why we're excited about them, and what are some of the graph use cases and schemas that we typically see our clients out are talking to us about. Um, and then um, I'm going to hand it over to Omar, and then Omar is going to do a deep dive on what we consider to be the frontier of AI, which is really using graphs to derive additional context and then leveraging that context to build much, much better models. Um, and then we'll give you a few tips on getting started. So let's get into it. Um, at EY, we have a massive uh, analytics practice. Uh, we have thousands of consultants deployed in various sectors. And uh, we are 100% behind graphs. Uh, we think this is a totally transformative technology. We believe that all the entire next generation of analytics is all going to be based on machine reasoning derived from graphs. And um, we think that probably 50% of the SQL workloads uh, in about a decade are actually going to be executed on graphs. And so that's what I'm betting. So where do graphs fit in? Um, so graphs um, are a variety of NoSQL databases. And so on the left, you know, you have your traditional databases, data, data warehousing. These were all databases that were designed 20, 30 years ago uh, when, when uh, compute power was at a premium. And so, you know, um, there's been a lot of workarounds that we now take for granted uh, that graphs are really disrupting. Other kinds of databases in the NoSQL uh, universe, uh, you have your document databases, uh, key value databases for you know, uh, limited high-speed querying, um, HBase, your wide uh, column stores, and then you have Neo4j, which is um, uh, the most enterprise-ready of all of the graph databases. Um, of course, Neo4j can talk to all of these other databases, and there's, of course, many other kinds of things that are happening in data. Um, all very exciting. So, but we're going to focus on graphs. So what's happening? Why are graphs becoming popular? This, is, this graph basically explains it, this chart here. Uh, so continual fall in the cost of computing. And what this has driven is just some amazing opportunities. So last year, AWS started offering single machines with four terabytes of memory. And you can get these for you know, a little over 10 bucks an hour. I mean, that's phenomenal, right? Four terabytes of data is a huge amount of data. And so you can now contemplate having an entire data fabric that represents all your most important data sitting in a single environment, a single computer um, that is actually gives you the fastest performance, way faster than a, than a network of distributed commodity machines. And so, you know, Microsoft being Microsoft, and I'm up in the Seattle area, so I see this kind of thing all the time. So Microsoft then says, well, we'll make a 12 terabyte one. And so now, in sometime later this year, you'll be able to go out onto Microsoft Azure and get yourself a 12 terabyte VM. I mean, this is phenomenal. I don't know what's going to happen you know, two, three years from now, right? I mean, it's very likely that five years from now, we could be looking at cloud-based servers that have 100 terabytes of memory, maybe a petabyte, right? It's crazy. It's insane. And so this is one of the things that's making graphs very, very interesting, particularly Neo4j, which is a scale-up uh, solution. So total market share, you know, graphs are still relatively small. You can see the thin green slice there, about 1.3% of the market. But as Emil pointed out this morning in the keynote, you actually look at which kinds of platforms are driving the most growth and actual interest from the community of practitioners. It's graphs. Hands down, it's graphs. Right? And so Neo4j is a, is a fantastic graph database. There's many other graph databases out there. And I think that this whole thing about big RAM and big graphs is basically going to eat up the, the traditional relational database world. You'll still be using relational databases for things like ERP systems um, because they have all kinds of optimizations for doing you know, straight kilometer addition and things like that. But now what companies are competing on is they're competing on speed to relevance. And to be relevant, you have to know a lot about the context, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But you know, you need views that cut across a whole bunch of data domains. And so graphs come in very handy for that. OK, so for the uninitiated, what's a graph? 
So a graph is just a visual construct. It's been around for a long time. Um, and here's a simple graph of an email eco of an e-commerce ecosystem. And so in this graph, you know, you can imagine we've got a whole bunch of emails. We're sending those to people. We're trying to get those people to come to websites. And obviously, what's happening on our website? That's where our product is. We want to sell the product, and we want to make sure that the product is actually in stock on the website. This is, and so this simple graph actually describes billion-dollar businesses like eBay. And of course, we've got nodes and relationships. And what's really fabulous about graphs is that that semantic representation, you know, we send email to people so that they visit our website and buy our product. And you have, if your leader was saying that's our business model and then they, and they wanted to know, you know, she wanted to know, well, how good at it are we really, right? That's the problem, right? And so then in a business, to solve that business problem, to run those analytics, you'd build a graph. And you'd design the graph like it is shown on the left here. And in a system like Neo4j, it's actually physically represented exactly that way in the database. Very easy. And then, and then you, can have the, you have the ability to have really great conversations with your business leaders. You can say, you know, did we get this idea right? Are we wrong? Did we miss something? And they can look at the schema directly and they can say, no, I don't think it really works that way. You're missing a step. There's a thing that's happening over here. There's a process you left out. And so you can have much richer conversations. The speed of development is way, way faster. OK. Um, what are some other things about graphs? So the traditional way that you query a database is it's a little bit like being a bricklayer. So I have these big tables. I have to know the keys and you know, the, the keys in each table and how those keys go together. And then I basically say, I'm going to take this big table, I'm going to take this big table, I'm going to take this big table, and I'm going to figure out what keys I need to join on, and I'm going to write that, write that query. And, and anybody that's been doing that kind of work, um, you know, once you get past about three or four tables, you're done. You're not going to write a single query that's going to hit 25 tables. Right? That query is not going to come back. And you know that already, right? Because you know that when you run the query, you consume runtime memory. Now, in a graph, you don't do that, right? So in a graph, what you do is you think like a snake. You're going through the grass. And there's a little query up at the top there. And I'll just read it real fast. So we're going to match all the email that was sent to a person who's named Steve. And I'm going to require that Steve has visited the website. And I'm also going to require that Steve has purchased a product that was sold on the website. And in that single statement, what you're looking at is basically a SQL correlated subquery. And that's, I don't know, two dozen words there. Um, very compact. And the way a graph database works is that you declare the traversal path. And for every single pattern where that path is true, you get back a row of data. And you can do, you can do really interesting and sophisticated things. OK, so what are some of the use cases? Lots of use cases. Um, and, the, and more are showing up every day. This is actually an old Neo4j slide. Um, it's been dropped from the main talk tracks, but I'd still love it. I'm hanging on to it. It'll be famous in 20 years. But um, we've got uh, lots and lots of use cases where uh, the, the point of the use case is you're connecting data across multiple domains. And so anytime you've got a process where you have a lot of, a lot of relationships between things, you've got dependencies, you have recursion, um, all of these uh, things where you're looking for either rare patterns or common patterns, all of these are graph use cases. And so at EY, what we're generally doing, if I was to stand back and say, OK, what is the kind of work that we're doing in EY? So what we typically are doing is we're putting in a graph layer over a data lake. And so there's been a lot of great work in data lakes. Um, data lakes are very good at ingesting data. They have all kinds of data in them, typically. They'll have unstructured data. They'll have whole snapshots of you know, big Oracle databases that, no, that nobody's gotten, ar gotten around to look at. Um, they'll have some really important data that's, that's gotten a lot of attention, and it's conformed, and it's curated. And then, of course, there'll be things like Kafka streams um, or Kinesis streams flowing into that warehouse as well. Now, ingestion, data, uh, data lakes are great at this. Syndication and distribution and getting data out to the edges in a common format, not so good at. And one of the big opportunities with graph is that you put a graph over a data lake, and now you have a common data fabric. You can work at one end of your data domain or the other end and start somewhere. And now you have a nice, flexible fabric. You can bring up the important data. You can connect the important data. And more importantly, you can drive a whole bunch of applications using Neo4j's terrific APIs. Very easy to do development against this. And then if you really want to do you know, more difficult tasks, you always have the opportunity to write your own Java. And so for a number of our clients, um, we're engaged in basically writing Java adapters 
that connect specific types of data sources and do certain operations directly in Java. So the whole, the Neo4j is fully extensible in that way. So whatever your functional area is, whether you're working in marketing or risk or data governance or you're doing, you know, um, uh, you know um, sales and marketing analysis, account coverage, um, all of these kinds of scenarios, um, there's usually going to be some business leader in your organization who's been saying for years, you know, I'm looking for a particular view and I just cannot get it. If you hear that kind of, a lang that kind of language in your organization, that's a cry for help. That person needs a graph. All right, so let's look at some graphs. Why is, why is Customer 360 so hard? So this is an example schema for Customer 360. And um, what you see here is um, we've got our customer in the middle. And what makes Customer 360 probably the most common use case we, inter we get um, is because it's very difficult to do when you actually sit down and think about it. And if I was going to walk around the dial here uh, going counterclockwise, you know, I might have all of my customer segmentation data. I might have all of my marketing touches from my various channels. Um, I might have all my product purchasing, my product hierarchies. Um, I've got my support tickets. Um, I have my, tender, my transactions and their tender methods. I have the channels through which that customer is purchasing. I have their entire account stack and history. How many accounts do they have? Right? What are all, what's all their login information? What's their billing address? What's their shipping address? And it's actually very difficult to do this in an enterprise because typically there's a dozen or more applications that are managing each chunk of this data, of this you know, heterogeneous data landscape. And it's only in a graph that you can very readily pull all this together and rationalize it. And so um, one of the things that you can do once you've got your customer 360 view in place, and this is a, a lot of the work that we do, is we actually build recommendation engines. Uh, we do a, other advanced uh, graph analytics. And so here's an example of an analytical graph that's built on top of a customer 360 graph. And what we, what's happening here is that um, all of these are product nodes, and the co-purchasing probability for every pair of products has been computed in the graph. And so there's thousands and thousands of products. There's been a pairwise calculation for every possible combination. And, and the graph calc has basically looked at what's the frequency that these two items are bought together in the same basket. And so I can show you what that looks like. I'll do a quick demo. Maybe we can flip over here. And for those of you who are good, we're all up. All right, so here's a, here is a typical node. This is a customer. And so anybody here have kids? Nobody has kids? Oh, all right, there's a couple of people with kids. Everybody recognizes this object. So this object is typically found at the bottom of your stairs in the dark. Um, and uh, if you step on it, bad things will happen. Uh, they never break, it's amazing. All right, so anyway, so this customer has bought this, this sippy cup, right? And so I'll go to full screen. And so this is basically what's going on in a graph, right? So all of the data is connected. And you can see here, as I expand the graph, I get another set of products. And so, you know, we've got some kid cutlery. And, you know, we've got kid, glass, kid glasses. And we've got some kid stepping stools. And you can see as I expand this graph, you start to see that certain things are highly correlated. So if I take this little stepping stool, um, there's been a whole bunch of these customers that have bought this together. And so there's a, you can see there's a frequency or a probability score at the bottom here. And so what happens with graph analytics is that you're actually setting relationships and you're putting scores and the output um, of your analytics directly back into the graph. And this does two things for you. This creates a, a new fabric of knowledge that is not known anywhere else in the enterprise. And it also um, creates a huge uh, opportunity for you to bring, um, as I like to say, not necessarily more intelligent experiences out to the edge, but certainly less dumb ones, right? And so the goal of AI, in my opinion, is to just be slightly less stupid than you are currently, and um, customers really appreciate it. And so, um, and so I'll show you what that might look like live. And so this is, um, and this is a framework that Neo4j has to demonstrate recommendation engines. It's called Recon, and so for example, since we're on the topic of kids. Um, I'll pull up a, uh, a kid's item here. How about this children's chair, okay? So now you can see this children's chair. This is in the basket. And what, just like I was clicking through the graph, there's an API. It's fired off a query to the database. 
And it's basically in those lower rows of products, it said, what are the surrounding neighbor products? And I filtered by the probability of a co-purchase. So I'm following that frequency of purchase relationship. And for every additional item that I put in uh, to the basket, I get another set of items. And, the, and it just continues to expand and expand and expand um, uh, and pulling up additional opportunities. And the nice thing about all of this is that you're guaranteed relevancy. Why are you guaranteed relevancy? You're guaranteed relevancy because you've looked at an entire ocean of purchasing behavior that's fully connected and linked. And your statistics are based on that. So this is very powerful. All right, that's it for the demo. And if we could go back to the slides. Perfect, okay. And Okay, and so then in a recommendation engine, these are the typical steps that you might go through. So, you know, you build your data graph, your customer 360 graph, you build all, out all your frequency associations. And actually, you know, Amazon uh, credits something like 25 to 35% of their revenue to their recommendation engine. And their recommendation engine only has two main relationships in it. It has customers who bought this, also bought this, and customers who searched for this ended up buying this. That's it, just two relationships and millions of products. And, and they're generating a huge amount of value. And so typically you would go through a set of steps. There's discovery scores, there's exclusions, so you don't recommend things that are out of stock. Maybe that you boost something because it's being marketed. Maybe you do some final checking in the post stage to make sure that you've got good category and diversity coverage. It's very simple, you can write these. Um, and then we've already seen the output. All right, so that's one use, um, customer 360 view, retail, B2C. Now in the B2B world, um, some of the stuff that happens is B2B um, customer 360 or account 360 graphs are actually very complicated. And they tend to be complicated because most businesses are amalgams of businesses that have been acquired. Uh, we have clients that have multiple divisions that have had legacy sales teams, multiple Salesforce instances and things like that. And so then the question comes out, you know, I got to email the customer. And that's a really tough question because first of all, I don't know which customer you're talking about and I don't know which email you want me to use, right? And I might have four or five representations of that. And so we're gonna hear a lot about MDM uh, here at Graph Connect, but very simply in a graph schema, you know, I might have uh, my customer, uh, that customer would be a business, but that business has contacts who are people. And then what you typically do is you explode all of the different identity elements for every one of those contacts and you make sure that you know what source that identity element came from. And so on the right, we have a bunch of different sources, and this might be um, a user uh, completed form, it might be third party data, it might be a Salesforce record, and each of these sources will have different levels of authority relative to your construction of a end or golden record. And so what you can do is you can actually put the probability of authority as a relationship and you can dynamically query this graph and come back with a golden record where every single element is as up to date as you can possibly make it. So that's pretty cool. And then typically the architectures for this is, you know, you would have all of the same stuff happening at the low level. You might have a semantic level layer where you're reconciling, you know, precisely what the different field names are across the different divisions that are contributing to this kind of a graph, and then you bring it up into Neo and hook it up to your applications. All right, so let's talk about finance. Um, one of the things that graphs are really great at is determining fraud and collusion and money laundering. And so everything that I've been talking about previously has all been looking at the common patterns. And so uh, graphs are very good, common patterns are typically can be interpreted as recommendation, but what about the rare patterns? And so usually in a graph, when you see a rare pattern, when you see a violation of what you would consider to be the canonical subgraph for whatever the entity is that you're looking at, there's something going on. Something's broken, somebody's trying to game something. And so in a uh, money laundering network, if I consider the green panel, you know, I might have a company um, and that company might have a bank account on the left there. And then they sent some money to a beneficiary and there's a beneficiary person. All looks perfectly legit. But then if I started linking some of these identity elements that I showed you previously, I might actually find something like, well, this company has a director. And this director uh, is, is, uh, also works for you know, another company. 
And curiously enough, that other company, which might be located in the Cayman Islands or someplace like that, has an address which is oddly, oddly similar to the same address we just wired $100,000 to, right? And that's embezzlement right there in a graph. Um, and so this is a very common use case. And so one of the, you know, when you look at transactions in a graph format, and this would be a sort of a generalized financial schema, you know, I have my transactions, I can actually set it up so that I can actually use the relationships to follow the directional flow of funds. Uh, my, I have my accounts, I have my parties, I might have a bunch of information about the parties. Um, you know, are they, for, are they, you know, as a foreign national, as a politically exposed person, et cetera. And all of these things can be interrogated in mind to understand what is the potential legitimacy of a transaction. So here's an example based on some real data we were looking at this spring. And uh, in this case, uh, we're modeling um, transactions as account months. So for every month, for a particular account, we build a subgraph. And this was a particular account that um, threw off an alert and a suspicious activity report uh, for this banking institution. And the reason is, is pretty obvious. Look at all those transfers of $10,000. So in a single month, this account took in $70,000 and washed out $70,000 and didn't really actually increase the, the end balance. Clearly an example of what's known as pass-through money laundering. Now here's the curious thing. This was the month that the alert and the report was raised. When we put this into a graph and we actually looked at this over time, it was very clear to us, if you start on the left, that for the prior year, it's going back, I think this was like 16 months maybe, um, this was a pattern of behavior that had been conducted regularly in this particular account. Um, even though that there were some alerts thrown off, none of those alerts were considered to be significant enough that they were ever followed up on. And yet in the graph, it becomes very, very clear that uh, this is a sustained pattern of money laundering. And so this is what this stuff looks like in a graph. And so you can look at all of these different dimensions. All right, so at this point, I'm gonna hand it over to Omar. Sure. So gonna, Omar, we're gonna hear about context. Yeah, so we're gonna continue on the money laundering use case, but before we do that, give you a little bit of background, right? So in financial services, from a data science machine learning perspective, we generally see that a lot of use cases are generally driven by a couple core competence needs and capabilities, right? Um, transcription information extraction, essentially converting all the unstructured data to machine readable formats, whether it's call centers, calls, texts, um, onboarding documentation, natural language processing, knowledge graphs, being able to put your data into graph, topology, machine reasoning, inference, whole new capabilities that enable a lot of machine learning use cases. Uh, you'll see how we're doing it for uh, money laundering. Uh, fundamental machine learning and deep learning, we kind of separate the two because we see that a lot of just general business use cases can just be solved with good data science and basic machine learning. You don't need to go into advanced methods like deep learning just yet. And I'll see the enabler is big data platforms, particularly things like Neo4j. So to give you a little bit of context for how we're tackling this problem or where our line of thinking has come from, right, for the money laundering use case, um, we can look towards DARPA, right? So they've essentially launched their new AI initiative this year where their focus is on enabling the third wave of AI. If you think of the first wave being your rules, decision-making trees, if-then statements, right, tax law, et cetera. Second wave is what we're currently seeing as a lot of AI right now, right? Your statistical-based learning for pattern matching. Throw it a lot of data. It understands the distribution of all the features, cuts it across, and gives you an output, right? your facial recognition software, you know, text classification, most of what we're doing in AI right now, if it's a classification type problem, can be considered the second wave. The third wave that DARPA is focusing on, though, is contextual adaptation. So that's essentially taking the output from your third wave of models and embedding additional context, right? additional inference or domain knowledge and, and giving that to the decision makers to actually make the decision. So it's no, and what does that really mean? Right? So it essentially means that it's no longer enough really to build a statistical model, get an output, and make decisions based on just that. You need to also build a system or design your data in such a way that it can also give you a reason for why those, uh, those decisions or statistical outputs are either correct or you can augment them with context. And if we were to find third wave AI is requiring context, you know, there's no better data model than say a knowledge graph to provide that context. Uh, knowledge graphs allow you to connect all your data, your concepts, ideas, your entities, all your different ontologies into one uh, very densely connected structure 
And those relationships are essentially what drives contextual learning and a lot of the context for you to make those decisions. And so the more connections you make, the more relationships you make, the stronger your knowledge graph, the more dense your information that you have at your fingertips to actually make decisions. I'll show you an example of what exactly I mean. Right? So let's say you're, you're a large bank, you've got multiple lines of businesses, credit cards, mortgages, you know, um, loans, et cetera. And let's say I'm one particular line of business. Each line of business obviously has all various different operations that they run. Right? And I have a customer who's got a retail deposit account with me. I'm making decisions on that customer based on the information I have on their retail account. This could be considered you know, decision making under relatively low context. There's a lot of other financial actions a person generally takes than just their deposit account. Now let's say I start connecting and start building with a classical customer 360 use case using a graph database, and I'm connecting the data that I have on that customer across all the products that they have in my institution. In this example, now this, I know the customer also has a credit card with me. This customer also has loans with me. Now I'm making decisions under a lot more context. If you take that a little further, right, you might have another customer in another area of bank, relatively the same types of products, but the one thing is they both are co-signers on a mortgage. Right? So here you can now infer an additional relationship between these two customers that there's a likelihood that they're cohabitating. And so now, by inferring this relationship, I've created additional context in my graph. And now, instead of just looking at each customer and making decisions on them individually, I can maybe start thinking of making decisions on them as a household. Right? More relationships, more context for your decision making. And so Neo4j, or the graph, data, the graph database as a knowledge graph, really helps create you that data model to surface all that context up at once for you to make your decisions, right? The way we generally work is you'll have your graph database across your multiple different data silos, establish your, you know, your customer 360 type use case, surface all that data up for your various different decision making or application layers, but then now because you've put your data in a graph, there's a whole slew of other mathematics and topology and type of concepts, or concepts um, and machine reasoning that you now have available. It's no longer just the data that's in the original data source. I can now also take advantage of the structure of the graph that I've built. Um, and so that gets us over to the difference between implicit and explicit knowledge that a knowledge graph brings uh, out and makes use of. So if you think of explicit knowledge as really just the knowledge that already exists in your databases, right? This is the raw stuff. You're bringing it up, stitching it together. You've got your database now. That's essentially your milestone one, right? A lot of businesses are not even there yet, as Michael was saying. Customer 360 is a pretty big problem. So this alone is a pretty big milestone, just getting that customer 360 view, having all your data in one place. But now that you've had it, the next step from an AI perspective is also doing all that machine reasoning and inference and putting in additional knowledge that doesn't exist in your actual data sources, but you're able to reason that it must be true within your actual graph. And you'll see examples of what I mean. All right, so example, you know, you might have in this particular toy diagram, you know, red goes to purple, goes to green, goes to yellow, therefore I can infer there might be some sort of relationship between red and yellow. All right, and what does that mean in a real world use case? Well, if I have person A and they've transacted with person B, I can infer that there's a relationship that person A probably knows person B, and I can put that into my graph. I can take that even further and using, you know, different types of math information theory or network science, I can make some sort of calculations that if person A transacts with person B, person B transacts with person C, then there's also some sort of probability of a relationship between person A and person C, right? And these are, you can start off with very simple business type logic for connecting your customers or your products together in this way. But if you keep building on this, you see that you know, there's a whole new world of mathematics that starts becoming available for machine learning and AI applications. Uh, and then so quick background on the uh, anti-money laundering use case, right? So current data affairs, it's a very rules-based process, right? Things, you essentially just have a bunch of alerts and thresholds, um, like, for example, if transactions over $10,000, create a flag. Uh, and the problem with this, though, is that you generate a very high false positive volume, so high that's not really humanly possible for an analyst to go through every single alert that comes in, right? And so not only that, but you're looking at 
this activity in a silo of one transaction. It's really a very complex, you know, nefarious human network and evolving behavior that you're trying to model with rules. So it's not, it's a very hard problem uh, to tackle in the current process. So what we're looking to do right now, we're working on is augmenting the current process using Neo4j and using some of the big uh, data tools like Spark for a lot of graph computation, GraphX for some of the graph uh, theory type calculations, and then machine learning and TensorFlow. And the goal is to really be able to first enable analysts when they go and review a flag to have additional context. In this case, what I mean by context is being able to actually view the context of that transaction. So viewing the entire network that a transaction occurred in, not just that account and that transaction only, which is what they currently do. Um, additionally, on top of that, because of the additional features that the graph structure allows me, I can potentially also create metrics to help bring down those false positives, right? There are certain structures that we can say, okay, this person is just literally just moving money from point A to point B, they just bought a mortgage. Right, that's a relatively common structure. I can create a metric around that, whereas a different metric, someone's moving money from point A to point C, point D, point uh, Q, all the, and then back to B, that's a different structure, that's a different metric. I can use those to reduce false positives. And eventually, you know, use a lot of graph analytics plus AI to potentially build some sort of deep learning model that can you know, help even further in detecting types of structures that normally would go completely undetected. Um, and then just a little bit of background as well. So, you know, this isn't a new type of thinking. We've been optimizing networks and information flow for some decades now, right? In this particular example, you know, you have your classic case of transportation hubs, Denver and LA, and then the regional airports. This is an optimized network, right? And we can take lessons learned from other industries that have to optimize how information or goods are transported to essentially also model money flow in the same way. If you are trying to get a mortgage, you're generally gonna move money in the most efficient way possible, right? Take it from the bank, put it towards your mortgage. If uh, financial institutions are the same way, everyone wants to move money in the most efficient way possible because the more steps you take, actually the, the higher cost. So if we think that as an example, we can take examples from you know, topology optimization, the telecommunication industry, the airline industry to really understand what is an anomalous network because it's inefficient versus what is potentially an efficient network and potentially not anomalous and just, just normal. So if we go back to the money laundering use case, right, if you look at some of these toy graphs, and these are the actual structures that we're actually seeing um, within real world like banking data sets. Uh, here in blue, I've got accounts that created some sort of alert. They created some sort of trigger. In green, I've got accounts that never went through, right? What would currently happen is an analyst would go look at one individual account individually only. They wouldn't have any information about the entire, the fact that, hey, these three accounts got alerted are actually connected together. Using graph databases, we can infer those relationships and we can surface that context to the analyst. So then, hey, look, your one account is actually linked to two other accounts that are only one hop away from each other. Maybe this is actually something nefarious and you know, it's not just someone taking out a big mortgage. And then take it a step further, you know, we're now inferring that these three triggered accounts are somewhat related, right? And we can create some sort of mathematical and business-based rules around that to bring that up. And if you take that even further, right, to other types of money transaction networks that we're seeing, right, you see an actual network such, uh, such as this, right? And you might say, okay, there's blues and there's greens, maybe I wanna look into it. But if we look at you know, what is an optimal way of money flow, this could also just be how the federal banking system looks, right? You have one central green uh, bank and money is just dispersed outwards, right? We have the mathematics to essentially look at this and say, well, yeah, this is a normal random dispersion of money flow Right? This is an efficient network. There's, nothing ineffi there's no inefficiencies caused by the structure of this. Go to the next step, and now you actually have you know, another network where you are noticing inefficiencies. Right? You are noticing it kind of follows a dispersion type of money model, but you know, there's clearly some interconnectedness hubs, and those do warrant some sort of inspection. So, by using knowledge graphs and using Neo4j and things like Spark, 
uh, GraphX and a lot of the APOC procedures, right? There's a lot of APOC procedures that do a lot of graph theory that we're using currently. We can start creating metrics to measure this stuff at scale, right? We can create metrics to measure how normal and efficient is the transaction network that we've created. Uh, we can create network uh, metrics to understand, you know, are there inefficiencies in this? We can uh, infer relationships to see, okay, what are the types of rings? So just baseline level, even, even before going to topology and graph analytics, just being able to give, hey, this uh, flag that you're looking at, here's the actual real world network for it. Take a look at the whole thing, not just the account. That's just step one. Step two would be, let's actually create uh, machine learning models and data science models to give you metrics to bring down false positives. And we're looking to do this at scale, right? So if you think of the actual underlying big data platform is Neo4j that contains all your transaction level data and your networks, you know, we can create those feature engineering, you know, your current AML process, all those features drawn there. You can do a lot of graph analytics to like betweenness, centrality type measures using Spark and APOC procedures. And then you can also bring in additional external features, right? So a lot of what happens is you might do negative news uh, where you essentially are on, during the onboarding process, they go and scrape uh, information on you if you've ever appeared in a news article and try and score that as to is it an adverse type media event or you know, what were you in the news for? All right, so that's just where we are now at base level. And then the next goal is to essentially use uh, a new field in deep learning that's being experimented now specifically just for graph type constructs uh, called a graph convolution neural networks. Uh, so we're also exploring the use of that to essentially try and make a deep learning or AI based model that can help us better understand money laundering. Um, mostly the biggest thing being that there are, what is a money laundering structure look like and can we train an AI model to actually be able to identify that versus just a normal uh, structure of money flow. All right, thank you, Omar. Oh, oh and then right. this same line of thinking, right? Also yeah, not Omar just said. in, uh, it's not just about uh, transaction networks, but you can do the same thing about your customer customer networks or your product to product networks, right? There's an entire topology of how your business actually is that most people, most places haven't even started thinking of, right? What are, there's the, and all that can help you with recommendation engines and a whole slew of use cases. All right. Thank you, sorry about jumping the gun there. Um, yeah. uh, thank you, Omar. So that was great. Um, so here's just a couple slides on how you do this uh, in practice with large data. Uh, so typically, if you're trying to get data out of the data lake, uh, what, what gets done is you build graph form tables. And so these would be ta big tables of nodes and big tables of mappings. So these would be tables that would have you know, millions, hundreds of millions of rows of data in them. Uh, you can zip those up. And then Neo4j has a very efficient high-speed loader. Um, this is some real statistics from a graph that I built a couple years ago. And so here you can see we're loading a half a billion nodes 2.2 billion relationships and 9 billion properties in an hour and a half. Um, then this is typical performance, and it's actually even getting faster and faster now. So that's the basic steps uh, for a build. Um, as Omar pointed out, if you want to turn on some of the advanced analytics, there's a couple pathways for you. Um, you can take data out of Neo4j, use your favorite data mining tool. You can use Spark. You can use the in-graph algorithms, but the most important aspect of this is happening on the right of those diagrams. You always write the results back to your graph. Always, always, always. And what that does for you is now your graph knows things and it learns things over time. And you can actually productionalize your analytics far more easy than if you've gone through a bunch of transformations and now you have a model and you have to untransform it and write it back to the SQL database or have a score table or something like that. So, very powerful um, to set relationships that represent the output of advanced analytics. And then finally, um, you know, this is what these environments can look like. Uh, so if you want to do a cloud-based sandbox to get going, you, know, you might put this on top of your Hadoop system. You'll need a big server. A you know, um, couple hundred gig is always a good place to start. Um, and uh, you can load that up with some of your favorite tools. Um, we build these kinds of sandboxes all the time. Uh, you can do this in AWS, Azure. You can do it on bare metal if you want. Um, if you have sensitive data, um, you might consider doing something like this. Uh, you can have an air-gapped solution. 
Uh, we have one of these back at the Seattle office, and this is an N NVIDIA DGX AI workstation. And so uh, this thing is not connected to the internet. We SSH into it, we move data into it, um, and then we do some modeling and some graph work in this. All right, um, I think that's the end of it. Um, I just want to remind you, so a um, couple, of, couple of things to think about. How do you know you've got some graph problems? Um, if you're hearing things like, how can I get a better understanding of my customers because I want to create more relevant experiences? How can I more effectively mobilize and syndicate the data that I'm ingesting? How can I get more business value and insight, deeper insights from the data that I already have? Um, and really, what's the ne next best action I can take? And this is really the whole purpose of graphs, is it's to enable you very quickly to choose what is the next best action. Uh, and so with that, uh, we'll wrap up. I think we're on time. We'll probably have a, uh, time for a few more questions. So thank you. Oh, sorry, I can't. They've got a really bright light, so I'm sorry. For entity resolution? Um, it's an important problem, yeah. And there's some interesting tools. So the question was, you know, um, what are some additional tools that can speed up um, doing master data management um, work? And certainly there are a handful of tools out there. Um, one, one tool is uh, Tamer, uh, which um, uh, basically uses predictive analytics to determine concordance in raw data um, and, can, and can help really speed up the initial staging and extraction of data from a lake. Um, in practice, you know, we, sometimes we use tools like that. Sometimes we use other kinds of you know, pipelining tools. Sometimes we just write the code manually. It just depends. Other questions? Oh, one more. Sure. So the question is, um, you know, what do you do when you have a lot of data? Um, so I have a couple of comments on that. So one is that, as I showed earlier, in the deck, the actual hardware is becoming more and more capable with every single year. It's double it, the capacity, the upper limit of what you can put into some of the new hardware is getting um, uh, increasingly higher and higher. So terabyte scale servers are common now. So you have that going for you. Um, the other thing is, is that typically when you build a graph, you know, you don't want your graph to just be a copy of your data lake. You want to go through a data value engineering exercise where you basically say, this is the important data to the business, and I need to represent these domains. I can leave certain data back in the data warehouse. Um, and then typically, like if I'm dealing with a lot of um, documents or blobs or other things, a typical thing to do in a graph would be you actually create nodes that are pointers to, say, the Mongo instance where those documents are actually kept. And so you can have, you know, all of the metadata um, in your graph, um, and then you can be pointing to you know, where the actual resource is that you might want to query uh, in a single transaction, right? Now the, and then the, the other thing that I'll point out is that you may think that you have a lot of data, and I know everybody has a lot of data, but if that data is sitting in tables, generally speaking, what we see is when you move data out of tables and into a graph, you'll get something like a 20 to 30% reduction in the total size of the data on disk. And that's because in a graph you have no nulls. Remember, most tables in a database are actually sparse. You've got rows and columns that intersect with no data in them. The database writes a null. And so um, it's a very common thing when we go, when we take data out of a, a Hadoop system, you know, we might have um, you know, a terabyte of data and that'll become reduced to like you know, a 350 gigabyte graph. Um, and that's not even a very large graph. That's just a you know kind of a medium-sized graph. So um, does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah. So we do um, probably the bulk of the work that we actually do is in that layer of doing the transformations, figuring out exactly how we want to design the graph so it has maximum performance, and we want to make sure that we're extracting the data with those relationships and those nodes instantiated in that way. So 
you know, graph design for large scale graphs becomes really important. You can make, you know, Neo4j is very forgiving if you don't have a lot of data, um, but there are certain design decisions that you make that have big implications. You know, should something be a relationship? Should it be a node? Should it be a property? Should it be one of the labels that's used for indexing? All of these are design decisions that have different performance implications to them. Uh, Well-designed graph, though, in general, you should expect you know, 100 millisecond response times for all of your singleton queries. Question? Oh, we're done? Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone.